Hi folks, my name is Jessica Swan. I'm the family counselor for Farley. And I wanted to uh, start today by introducing myself and then talk a little bit about uh, the disease of addiction and help folks understand what that is and why we call addiction a disease. Um, I'm gonna walk through some things uh, about that and about the brain. Um, but I'm Jessica Swan. I am a licensed substance abuse treatment practitioner in Virginia, hired uh, by Farley to create the virtual family program, which we've been running uh, now for several months. Uh, due to the pandemic, we uh, sort of lost our in-person programming and transitioned to a virtual program last year. And we've been doing that ever since. And we thought it would be nice to have a few things recorded for everybody. Um, so that you could access this anytime if you can't come to the Lunch and Learns, which are right now held every Friday from 12 to 1 on Zoom. If you're looking for more information or want to know more about our family program, you can contact me directly. Um, my phone numbers and my email address are here on the slide. And uh, you can also contact Farley Treatment Center directly for more information. Okay, so today's agenda, um, like I said, we're going to talk about addiction. We're also going to talk about um, why it's called a disease. Uh, we're going to talk about the brain and how addiction affects the brain. Um, and I think a big thing that is hard for folks to understand is why some people respond differently to certain substances and other people than other people, right? So particularly with alcohol, that's hard to understand, um, and marijuana, um, where some people don't have a substance use disorder, might have used a substance and can not ever develop the disorder. Um, and so what's the difference in those people and what, what does it look like for a person that has this disorder? Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the physiology, meaning like how the body um, is affected when you drink or use drugs, um, the detox withdrawal and um, the use of substances. And then uh, a little bit about what happens for treatment and recovery. So first let's start off um, with some definitions. Um, the Addiction, uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine, ASAM, uh, describes addiction quite thoroughly on their website. Um, they are the um, medical organization uh, that certifies folks um, with MDs in um, addiction medicine. So you can get board certified in addiction medicine and we have folks at Farley that, that have that designation. Um, and ACM uh, developed a very, very long definition of what addiction is. And you can go to their website and read that. I think it's like four pages long, actually. Um, and we're not really interested in reading that much information about um, this and, and the complexity of it, but, but that just goes to show you just how complex this disease actually is. Um, I pulled their short definition so that we can start there and have something to jump off from. Um, and I'll just read that out loud to you here. So the short definition, according to ASAM, is addiction is a treatable chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an ind individual's life experiences. People with addiction use substances or engage in behaviors that become compulsive and often continue despite harmful consequences. Prevention efforts and treatment approaches for addiction are uh, generally as successful as those for other chronic diseases. So uh, we talk about this uh, disease as a chronic disease and we use a lot of comparisons um, with addiction uh, to things like cancer, diabetes, heart disease, sometimes asthma, all of those diseases are chronic um, and uh, there's very similar kind of relapse and remission rates. So I'll use some of those comparisons probably today when I'm talking. Um, so this is a kind of wordy but good definition of what addiction is. And I think that it's a good jumping off point. I just wanted to kind of ground us in this and then move forward with understanding a little bit about uh, uh, some highlights here. So uh, addiction is characterized by certain things, right? So there's an inability to consistently abstain. There is impairment in behavior of control, um, craving, diminished recognition of significant problems with one's behaviors and interpersonal relationships, and a dysfunctional emotional response. Um, so like other chronic diseases, uh, addiction involves these relapse and remission cycles. Without treatment or engagement and recovery activities, addiction is progressive and can lead to uh, disability or death. 
So it's a very serious disease and um, treatment uh, needs to match the level of the disease that the person has. Um, so the disease progressive in an earlier stage and earlier intervention or an earlier type of treatment would be used just like with cancer. Um, and when you have an earlier catch of cancer, uh, you, you can treat it with a lighter treatment. The later stages of it require much heavier dosage, dosages of treatment. Um, when we think about uh, a few of these components, I'm going to go through them again in a little bit, but uh, some of them are obvious to you, right? Like the inability to abstain. Um, you probably see that in, in your loved ones or in yourself, uh, depending on who you are watching this. Um, and uh, impairment in behavioral control, right? Not only do substances cause that, but also not being on the substance can, um, you can see this uh, impairment in behavioral control, um, where people act differently than they used to. Um, um, and then the development of craving, which I, I like to remind folks um, who don't have substance use disorders, um, that craving is a little bit like, ooh, a cheeseburger sounds good for lunch, except that it's much more ruminative, obsessive, uh, much stronger, and the drive is much, much stronger, um, much louder. Um, so it's sort of like, I got to have it. I got to have it. It's like running in the back of my head. Like, I really want to have that. How can I get it? What can I do to plan for it? What do I, what's in the way? How can I do this? Well, how can I make this happen over and over and over? Um, the others are probably a little bit obvious also. So people, uh, it's easy to see when you have problems in your relationships, I think, and easy to see those behaviors um, more readily than some of the other uh, symptoms. So a little bit of history here. Um, the American Medical Association actually um, started calling alcoholism a disease back in 1956. So for a long time now, we've been using this terminology. That, um, that basis for starting to call alcoholism a disease actually comes from Marty Mann, who was uh, the first woman in Alcoholics Anonymous. So uh, Bill Wilson, uh, back in the old, old days, uh, 1930s, um, started Alcoholics Anonymous with a guy named Bob. And Bill and Bob started the um, program by helping each other and developing some steps. And um, about the first 100 people um, then came together and um, you know, started meetings and literature and things like that. Marty Mann was uh, the first woman in that group of people. Um, she's a very fascinating woman, um, very, uh, very bad alcoholic, um, and got sober relatively young, um, in her 30s. And um, she was very interesting. She was very wealthy. She was uh, gay. She lived out loud um, and uh, uh, not in the closet, which is really unusual for that time. And she also was a huge advocate for people with alcoholism and helped people um, get sober uh, throughout her life from the time that she got sober on. Um, and she was a huge proponent of trying to get people um, in uh, society to start understanding that alcoholism is a disease. And so she was a big push behind uh, folks starting to recognize this as actually a brain problem that like there was something significantly and trackably different with people who had alcoholism relative uh, to like that to others who do not have it. Um, so shortly after the APA um, started, the APA is American Psychological Association, they started calling um, alcoholism and addiction uh, diseases uh, in the 60s. Um, and then it sort of progressed from there. You know, a lot of this was a push to start to help remove stigma. Um, that has worked somewhat um, with a mixed response over the years. You know, things have gotten better. Uh, things are uh, with addiction and, and our society's view of it as a, um, a moral failing instead of, you know, that's, that's historically how we viewed it. And, and we really try hard to get folks to understand that this is not about self-will or being a bad person or um, not... Uh, not being good enough somehow. Um, this is more about a brain that responds differently and a body that responds differently to um, events and genetics and uh, substances. The uh, other folks that recognize alcoholism and addiction as diseases is extensive. Um, this is something you can easily do your own research on if you want. Um, there's lots and lots of lists of folks, uh, organizations that call addiction a disease. Um, I did a cursory 
overview of things in 2021 again. And this is a very short list. There's a there's actually some long lists of organizations that call alcoholism and addiction diseases. Um, but here's some important ones: the you know Medical Association, Psychiatric Association, American Bar Association, ASAM, what I've already told you about, American Hospital Association, the Public Health Association, Social Workers, College of Physicians, the World Health Organization, just to name a few. Um, so let's kind of go over a little bit more in depth what a uh, disease is. So when we talk about any disease, we talk about the disease having an onset of certain symptoms. So, um, you know, with this disease, you're going to have um, sort of like normal use and then of whatever substance, and then there'll be certain symptoms that start to appear, right? We talked a little bit about some of those. Maybe it's craving, maybe it's loss of control. Maybe it is um, sort of some social impacts or some legal impacts or, um, you know, just a development of tolerance and using more and more over time, things like that. Um, there'll be certain symptoms that start to show up um, that start to say, okay, this might be a disease. With um, other diseases, it might look like um, let's say, you know, like high blood pressure or um, we, that, that can also happen with this disease, by the way, um, or um, uncontrollable blood sugar with diabetes, right? So there's certain things that start to show up and um, they, they fall in that first category. So every disease has to have that. The next one is a predictable progression through an early, middle, and late stage. So all diseases sort of have progressive nature to them. Um, addiction does as well. Um, in the early stages, there will be far fewer um, physiological issues than there are in the middle and late stages where um, the body really starts to take a hit. Um, you know, the liver starts to have some significant problems, development of uh, fatty liver disease, and then eventually uh, cirrhosis happens. Um, you can get brain damage, um, you can, uh, develop some significant anxiety. Um, you might have some significant problems with stomach, uh, pancreas, kidneys. So, you know, physiologically, there are very significant things that start to happen to the body over time, but there's also um, mental, social, legal, all of those types of things start to show up. Uh, diseases are treatable. Um, to what degree they're treatable depends on the disease. Um, we know with addiction that it is a treatable disease um, with... Uh, somewhat good success rates actually over long term. So um, while we know that treatment works, um, treatment has to work on a continuum and it has to uh, match the level, the level of care needs to match the level of disease that, or progression of the disease that the person has, like I had mentioned earlier. Um, and so that's really important with, with, this, with uh, this disease, but with all diseases, right? Um, and so we try to match those things up so that the person is receiving the right amount of care for the disease they have. Diseases are prone to relapse. Um, this uh, alcoholism, addiction, substance use disorder, whatever you want to call it, all the same word, uh, or they're all interchangeable words, excuse me, um, are prone to relapse. Similar rates of relapse happen with other diseases such as cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. And actually heart disease has a little bit of a higher rate of relapse. Um, what we do see is, is that um, folks will tend to somewhere between three and seven uh, times have relapses on average. Um, so, you know, the, the mean of that is five, um, five relapses over time before a full length, uh, long-term remission takes place. Um, that's not always true for people, but that does happen. Um, and that can happen prior to people getting treatment too. So I always like to remember, uh, remind folks of that, that like sometimes there have been many several different types of treatment episodes, or sometimes people have tried on their own a few times um, before they get into an inpatient setting, for example. So there are a lot of different ways that relapse looks, uh, but um, just know that it, it frequently is part of the disease, um, but that most people do enter remission and stay in remission long term. In fact, there's newer research out about 75% of people that receive treatment um, for substance use disorders stay in remission long term. So um, that's a pretty good success rate, actually, a bit pretty good outcome. Um, it's a long term outcome. Remember, many people relapse um, in the shorter term and then over a longer period of time, um, we're talking five years and longer, um, they will uh, be in recovery. 
Um, and the other thing is, is that uh, diseases are, are fatal if left untreated, right? So if you think about um, uh, physiological diseases such as like cancer or diabetes, um, if they're not treated, they, they will kill you. If you think about mental health disorders such as depression or bipolar, same thing. Um, people frequently die from those diseases if they go um, untreated. So we try to, again, get treatment for whatever it is the disease is. Um, and addiction basically meets all of these criteria. So this is the essence of why we call it a disease. It fits the criteria of what a disease is called based on these five uh, buckets. Um, the onset of certain symptoms um, in a disease uh, looks like this. I kind of went over this a little bit already, but in, in a little more detail here, this loss of control. So if you think about loss of control, um, for example, it might be like, you know, I'm going to go out tonight and have two glasses of wine, and then maybe you stay out all night and have, you know, 15 or 20 glasses of wine, okay? That's an easy uh, example of loss of control. Another good example is driving drunk, right? Like, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to drive, I'm just going to let somebody, or I'm not going to drive tonight, right? I, I, if I drink too much, I'll, I'll leave my car. Um, and then people wind up uh, driving, right? It's an easy way to see that there's a loss of control. But really what we're talking about is we're unable to predict what the outcome is going to be. If, uh, if we have one drink or one use of a drug, we're unable to predict what if I'm going to just have one or if I'm going to have 10 or if I'm gonna have 30, it's hard to know. Um, continued use despite negative consequences. So with this example, it is like, um, you know, most people when they drink um, or use drugs and it doesn't go well, they don't desire to do it again, right? Um, and they say, okay, that, that this was a negative consequence. For example, if you're a normal, normal person and you go out and you drink and you drank too much and you threw up, right? You might say, okay, I'm not gonna do this again for a while. That was too much, that was bad. Like, I do not like the way I felt. I do not wanna drink. Um, and so you, that's, that's a negative consequence, right? And so you stop using for a while or you say, I'm not gonna do that anymore or whatever. Um, for people that have a substance use disorder, that's not the case, right? They will go, uh, oh, that was fun. Let's do that again, right? Um, or, you know, the next day they're like, okay, gosh, I drank too much then, but uh, I'll just see what happens this time, right? No, no big deal. So there's this continued use despite mounting negative consequences, and they can be quite large and people continue to use, right? DUIs can mount up, divorces happen, loss of children, like um, massive, big, terrible negative consequences can happen and people will continue to use. Okay, um, development of craving, which I talked about before, this sort of I gotta have it, gotta have it, gotta have it thing. And then development of tolerance is the other uh, onset of symptoms that we see um, uh, from, from the get-go with the substance use disorder. And tolerance just means that like, you know, a little bit over time and an increase over time, um, you know, from this point, looking back, you say, oh my God, how did I get here drinking this much? Well from the beginning to now, um, I have developed a tolerance over time. So now where I drink 10 to get the same desired effect, I used to only need five. All diseases are primary, chronic, and progressive. Um, and basically what we talk about with primary is simply to understand that the disease is its, uh, its own. Um, it's not really secondary to some other type of disease. It's a disease into itself. Um, I like to kind of say like it doesn't cause stress or other problem or not, it isn't caused by stress or other problems, although they are frequently occurring together. And frequently it's having the disease is causing the stress and problems in the person's life, right? So we kind of put the things in the wrong order sometimes where if we think about it, like if I were to um, quit drinking, maybe the stress levels in my life would go down a little bit. Um, so it's, it's a little bit tricky because there is a high correlation between trauma and um, substance use disorders. There is a high correlation between stress and substance use disorders, um, primarily because you will like say, oh my gosh, I have a stressful life. I think an out, a drink or a drug might help me relieve myself of that. Um, and it may temporarily, but what happens is then the drug or drink takes over and then becomes its own cause of stress and mounts on top of the other stress instead of relieving it. So that's the way to think about it. Um, it gets a little confusing, but the, the main thing I think with primary is to just understand that it is in itself a disease. 
it can frequently co-occur with many other types of diseases. And, and in fact, um, uh, more people than not have uh, depression and anxiety who also have um, substance use disorders. So they co-occur quite highly. Um, also co-occurring with bipolar uh, frequently. Um, and as I mentioned, trauma, a high rate of trauma uh, correl correlates with uh, substance use disorders. But you don't have to have one to have the other, but you might have both, and those are call both primary, chronic, and progressive uh, components of your life. Similarly, you would also have maybe diabetes, also a primary disease unto itself. You could also have heart disease. You could also have cancer, right? And those are all going to be primary co-occurring diseases. The chronicity of the disease is something that I've already talked about, but would just say that it gets worse over time, not better. Um, and so it needs to be treated or intervened on at some point in order to um, get into remission. Uh, and it's a permanent disease. Um, it can be treated, it can be helped, but um, once a pickle, always a pickle. And this is a tricky thing for folks because we like to think that maybe we're cucumbers. Um, so I can tell you that like, I, I'm, I'm a person in recovery from alcohol and drugs almost 15 years now. And um, I uh, was probably, predisposed to becoming a pickle, right? I come from a family where we have alcoholism in our family. Um, and so probably when I first started drinking as a teenager, um, I probably turned to a pickle pretty quickly. Um, and then um, kind of wanted to think, well, maybe I'm just a cucumber still and I would drink still and like use drugs still. And then I would realize, no, I'm still a pickle, right? Um, it's an easy way to kind of think about this. Like um, that's, that. That's one way that you become a pickle. Um, the other way is that you do enough of a substance often enough. And some substances are highly addictive, right? So um, if you do opioids frequently enough, um, over the course of a month, you'll be a person with an opioid use disorder. It doesn't take very long at all. Um, cocaine, same thing. Um, so that includes crack, methamphetamines are also that way. Um, so a lot of those drugs are like high addictive liability. You, you get um, hooked to them very quickly. Um, so you turn into a pickle pretty quickly, but you might think, oh, I remember being a cucumber. Why can't I go back to being one, right? Same thing happens with alcohol or THC. You do enough of it often enough, you're gonna become addicted to it. It's just how it is. Um, but if you um, are predisposed to it, that's also gonna happen. So there's kind of two ways for it to happen, the genetic predisposition or the frequent use of the substance. Either way, once you become a pickle, you're always a pickle. You can put it into remission, but you can't turn back into a cucumber. Progressive nature of the disease is, is something that I've talked about a lot, but we just produce a lot more negative consequences over time. So the, the negative consequences are progressive where they're not so bad in the beginning, they might get worse and worse over time. And usually by the time a person enters an inpatient treatment facility, negative consequences have gotten pretty severe. Okay, so what's going on in the brain of someone with a substance use disorder? So let's talk about this for a second. Um, the brain uh, produces a bunch of dopamine in the midbrain or the reptilian brain. It's called the reptilian brain because it's that old part of your brain. It's the very center, kind of right above the brain stem. There are several components that make up that area of the brain. Um, the ones that um, are highly um, affected in substance use disorders are the basal ganglia, nucleus accumbens, ventral tegmental, and extended amygdala. And the, the main areas of dopamine production in the body um, happen there. You know, dopamine happen, uh, is produced in some other areas of the brain um, and, uh, and releases uh, good feeling good chemicals, but the most of it is coming from the midbrain. Um, and that midbrain really is in charge of your survival. And so we call it the reptilian brain. It's the oldest part of the brain. It's very similar. Actually, it is the same as a reptile's brain. Um, ours just has a lot more built out on top of it because we are much higher thinkers, right? We have a lot more to our brain. Um, but everybody needs that basic part um, in order to, well, breathe, eat, have sex, um, food, shelter, things like that. So all types of like mammals and um, reptiles have this kind of a brain um, that help them to uh, link pleasure and survival. Okay, so dopamine links pleasure, survival. And then the third part is it says you need to do that again, right? I mean, that's kind of obvious, but um, I think it's important for the way that we talk about this. It's like that felt really good. 
do it again, Jessica. That felt really good. Do it again. Um, so when you first are born and you start breathing, that's what's happening there. And it becomes very automatic very quickly. But things like drinking water, like if you're very thirsty and you drink a glass of water, that it feels so good, right? Um, and that keeps you alive and it feels really good. And you know to do it regularly, right? Same with all these others. Okay, so that's what the role of dopamine is. It's, it's rewarding you for doing something that keeps you alive. The other part of the brain that is affected with substance use disorders is our frontal lobes. The frontal lobes are those human parts of our brain um, that are really big and make us have funny looking heads um, or what are normal to us, but they, this front part of our brain is our executive functioning, right? We have uh, rational thought, values, judgment, decision-making, personality, all types of stuff um, develop out of those frontal lobes, also called the neocortex or prefrontal cortex. Um, and it's really our higher thinking that happens there. Um, what happens with addiction, well, what happens in our brains is basically our midbrain sends messages to our frontal lobes and other areas of our brain, and then other areas of our brain and our frontal lo lobes send message back to the uh, midbrain. So there's this high level of brain circuitry happening. I am really boiling this down to like very simplistic nature. So if you're watching this and you're a neuroscientist, um, please don't hate me. I'm just trying to get this message out to as many people um, to understand this as possible. So I've got broken it down to its most basic way um, or its most basic components. But, but with that caveat, just know that there's a bunch of messages being sent throughout your brain all the time. The main ones that we're talking about with addiction that are problematic start to be from the midbrain to the frontal lobes and back. That message process gets messed up when we have addiction. Um, essentially, our pleasure pathway gets hijacked, right? So it feels really, really good when you use drugs or alcohol, right? Um, you experience a lot of pleasure and that's because a lot of dopamine is being dumped out of the, of the midbrain. So you can imagine what the problem would be if you have a lot of dopamine getting dumped out of your midbrain um, over and 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 over, and over right? Um, what starts to happen is you need more of an outside substance to come in because your own brain isn't producing enough of it on its own. It's not triggering uh, the production of dopamine. My midbrain says, Jessica, you need more of that drug in you so that you can be okay. AKA, Jessica, you need that so that you can survive. Jessica, you need more of that so that you can survive. Jessica, do that again, that felt good. You need that to survive. People who have regular brains don't have that interaction happen, okay? So they don't have this process of the drug becoming number one on midbrain functioning such that the brain in, in the midbrain is saying, do it again, do it again, you need that to survive. So in my example from before, right, a, a person who um, drinks too much, goes up, wakes up the next day, is like, oh, I'm done with that, that was too much, I don't know why I did that, that was dumb. Um, and the person who drinks too much throws up the next day says, oh, I did too much. I'm going to try again and see what happens next. That person, the difference between those brains is this right here. That second person has the drug showing up, the number one on the brain functioning saying, I need that more than these other things in order to get okay again. Okay. Um, you know, another way to think about it is I have depleted my own dopamine production and I need a substance to come into my system to help me because I don't have enough of a feel good, okay feeling chemical in my brain. That's another way to think about it. So by the time people wind up in inpatient treatment, there's usually a significant midbrain problems, right? Like, like, what you can see on the outside would be people who are struggling with um, maybe uh, their household, right? Not paying bills, um, getting kicked out of the house, couch surfing, staying at their parents again, things like that, right? Um, it's like, I need this to survive. I don't need to worry about my house. That's not a list of, on my list of things to be concerned about. I need the drug to survive. Once I have my drugs or alcohol, maybe I'll think about like caring about that. But right now, that's what I need. Once I get that, maybe this, right? Same thing with relationships, lots of relationship problems for folks that wind up in inpatient treatment usually. Usually food is a problem, meaning our nutrition is not good by the time we're in inpatient treatment. Um, drinking water, dehydration is usually a problem for people. Um, we reinforce drinking water all the time because of that. Um, and then oxygen is the same kind of thing where people will say, I don't need I don't care about living or dying. I don't care about breathing. I care about 
drinking or using. I need that to survive. Then maybe I'll care about this, right? And so that's kind of this process, this like bad communication process that's happening in the midbrain that is sending kind of confused or unusual signals to the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes are sort of like this area where we have this message that's being sent and um, it's like the frontal lobes are on, but nobody's home, right? And so things start to get cloudy where the frontal lobes well, if you've ever drank or done drugs, you know that like you make different kinds of decisions when you're drinking or using than you would if you were not drinking or using. So they, not only does the substance actually affect the frontal lobe, but the communication process for someone who has a substance use disorder is disrupted such that the frontal lobes are not operating properly to send messages back to the midbrain saying, it's not as important to remember this here. You, this is okay. Here's the better way to go about this. Remember who you are, Jessica. You know, here's a better decision to make. Don't go against your values, right? Um, so what happens for people like loved ones will say, you know, I don't know, Johnny used to be such a good boy or like I didn't raise him to have these values or um, I don't even know who he is anymore or um, why, how could you do that? Why did you make that decision? Or like, what, you know, why aren't you thinking clearly, right? All of that stuff has to do with literally the brain not working properly and, and the midbrain really sort of driving the bus or making the rules or, um, you know, saying, here's what I need to survive and the frontal lobes just kind of going along with that or being used um, in advancement of that right so I may use um, my frontal lobes in order to get the drugs I need or the alcohol I need in order to survive um, so these start to like go away um, at, at over time right um, and so that's the real problem with this the other problem, um, which is out of some newer research out of Sweden, um, is around serotonin. So I, I said earlier that there's a high correlation between um, alcohol uh, use disorder, substance use disorder, and um, also depression or anxiety or both. Um, and that has to do with serotonin production. So um, serotonin can actually help mediate this process so that you know, if you had sort of, let's say a normal or a healthy brain um, and you had uh, a lot of dopamine somehow because you used a substance, um, maybe you would also have enough serotonin in your new brain to interrupt the process and say, yes, Jessica, that feels really good. That felt good to get drunk or that felt good to get high using that substance. However, serotonin will say it felt good, but you need to get back to a stable place. You need to get back to a stable mood again, Jessica. Don't remember that and, and have it be something that needs to be repeated. Um, remember it, but don't need to remember it in such a way that we have to do it over and over right? Serotonin can help mediate the process so that it keep, kind of keeps you evened out and says, Jessica, here's what you need to remember. Get to an even keel. Get to a healthy, mood-stabilized place, okay? So serotonin is implicated, right, in diseases of, um, of depression, anxiety, um, obviously bipolar. Um, so this process, this communication process is disrupted in folks that have both. Um, and so what we know is, is that the folks that have um, not enough serotonin in their brain are not going to get that process interrupted enough, and they're easily going to become people that uh, have a drug become number one in midbrain functioning. Okay, so um, while it feels good no matter what, if you use a drug or drink, um, there are processes in the brain that um, need to be in place in order for a person to not become hooked on the substance. Okay, so um, the uh, depletion of dopamine, this is just, I have a bunch of brain scans here that I was just gonna show you all. Um, there's a healthy brain on the left-hand side here, and then a person in early um, recovery from a cocaine use disorder. And these are brain scans, uh, you know, where they give you a nuclear medicine attaches to the D2 reception, um, or the D2, uh, which is dopamine in the brain. And um, in the midbrain, you can see a lot of activity in that healthy control. All that red is high activity. 
um, yellow, then green, and then blue is the lowest activity. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see that a person in early recovery from cocaine use disorder has far, far less dopamine active in the midbrain. Um, and you know, there's some scattered spots or and a little bit, but it's not, it's not nearly as um, active and whole as a person with a healthy uh, brain. Um, here is an example. Uh, we've got a healthy control um, with um, the top three brains. Um, mid, this middle section here, this is a person who um, is in recovery 10 days abstinent uh, uh, from uh, cocaine. And this is a person on the bottom at 100 days abstinent from cocaine. Um, and so you can see that the dopamine functioning starts the return, uh, but it is far, far less than it used to be or might be in a person with a healthy control brain is how I should say that, right? So um, one thing to know then is, is that early recovery um, is hard for people um, and it's hard for a good reason. Um, the brain is not working properly. The brain is not producing enough dopamine on its own. Again, if you have um, a, a substance use disorder plus um, not enough serotonin, right? You're, all, you're really not going to feel good. Um, because serotonin is like a mood stabilizing and a feel good chemical, so is dopamine. Um, the other thing to mention is that other I mean, substances affect other types of neurochemicals as well. I'm just talking about this because this is the one that affects, um, is affected by all substances. Um, but, you know, dopamine is like the main one, but there's also norepinephrine and GABA and um, I'm not thinking of others, um, I guess endorphins, there's, there's a bunch of others too. Um, that are affected by um, the use of drugs and alcohol or having this substance use disorder. Here's what I was talking about, how there's, um, by many different types of substances, they all affect the midbrain. Here's cocaine, meth, alcohol, and heroin brain scans. Um, again, with the nuclear medicine attached to the D2 dopamine receptors, um, they're lower in people who have these um, alcohol use disorders, uh, heroin use disorder, meth uh, use disorder, and cocaine use disorder. You can see that the green um, is there on all of them, but not very much red um, and even very little yellow really on all of these brains on the right, whereas the healthy controls on the left have far more activity, um, uh, have far more uh, dopamine activity. Here's one where they did the same thing, but with serotonin um, and serotonin transporter activity in the brain of a methamphetamine abuser. Um, the healthy uh, controls are on the top. Um, so that's what a healthy brain um, activity of serotonin looks like. Um, and then on the bottom, we have a methamphetamine abuser um, where there's almost no serotonin. So that can, you can imagine what that looks like then, um, pretty moody. Um, instability as far as mood goes. Um, and also there's a, a relationship between night and day, um, literally that night and day, like so melatonin at nighttime is produced serotonin during the daytime. And so without that um, process happening, um, there is a hard, it's hard for people to regulate like their schedules. So actually being in treatment, a part of um, the treatment is regulating a schedule, being awake during the day, sleeping at night, trying to get on a regular um, sleep cycle. I put this in here because marijuana affects the brain also, um, and you can become addicted to THC. People, there is a marijuana use disorder. Um, there's marijuana anonymous uh, for folks that have marijuana use disorders. Um, like alcohol, um, not all people that use THC are going to become addicted to it. Um, some people can abuse it and not become addicted to it. Um, same thing happens with alcohol um, and other drugs. So. Um, I just wanted to put this in here because you can see here the midbrain is also affected with cannabis. Um, there is actually additional um, areas of the brain that are affected, particularly around memory, um, uh, sensory information, um, anxiety, uh, and activity. Um, so sometimes like the brain, um, uh, yeah, and also the hypothalamus, which is interesting, controls appetite. So, you know, people will eat quite frequently when they get um, high on marijuana. If they, if they get 
enough of it, right? It turns some of this off, like, so you think you're hungrier than you actually are. So anyway, so there's a lot of the miscommunication processes that start to happen, but motor control is one of them also. Um, that's basal ganglia area. Um, so this is just sort of a scan about that and um, the different areas that are affected and just noting that some of the same areas are affected um, when smoking THC. Here is some brain scans of a marijuana use disorder brain on the bottom with um, comparison of a healthy control on the top. Um, you can see the different like um, slices sort of uh, or scans through the different uh, components of the brain at different levels. Um, you know, so the deeper levels over here on the right versus the top levels on the left. Um, and uh, you can kind of see the activity or the lack of activity um, relative to um, particularly some frontal lobes and also midbrain activity uh, in the marijuana use disorder brain. Okay, so let's talk about um, alcohol use and alcohol withdrawal. Um, it, this could also be um, benzodiazepines, which are drugs like Valium, uh, uh, Librium, um, Ativan, Lorazepam, a lot of the drugs that end in PAM um, are benzodiazepines, anti-anxiety drugs, and they're addictive. Um, they're all in the same class of um, drugs, and they produce effects, right? Like, so no matter who you are, if you take in that substance, you're going to have a effect produced from it. The more you take of it, the more affected you become. Okay, so the orange line here is your natural threshold. The blue line that goes down, that is, let's say, the intake from taking in alcohol as an example. The uh, symptoms are shown on the left here. So you have a little bit of a drink, you might feel a little relaxed. The more you drink, you feel calm, euphoric, less inhibited, you start to lose control over how you feel or what you say. Um, you know, so the more you drink, the more effects you have. Um, as if you stop there and then come out, you come out the top side, the top side is the detox side. And I'll talk about detox in a second, but there's basically a mirror reaction. Um, so however much you go down on the blue on the bottom, you're gonna come out on the top uh, in, a, in a direct reflection. It's called a sine curve if you care. Um, so the, uh, the more you drink, like you lose track of time and space. You can't believe this last call already. Um, you lose control of your motor uh, abilities, right? You fall out of your bar stool. You trip over the doorway. That I was very clumsy when I drank. Um, and I, you know, I drank a lot, right? So the places that most people with substance use disorders would drink, they'd be like all the way down, a much lower curve than, than what we see here, where you start to have a slowing of your autonomic system. Um, uh, like I, you know, a lot of people would, like me would like black out um, and pass out. So you can see like your vital signs start to go slow down and then you start to like lose consciousness, right? That's pretty common for people who have a, a chronic um, progressive like late state, later stage uh, substance use disorder. The interesting thing to note is, is that when you're getting into those phases of drinking or using, you are very close to going into a coma or dying. Um, and in fact, people do um, drink themselves into a coma or into death. If you drink enough, fast enough, and can't get it out right of your system by either, you know, throwing it up or, um, you know, getting it out one way or the other, um, if you do it too fast, your body will shut down and, and die. And, and, you know, sometimes you'll see that in college with kids that are, you know, fraternities or sororities or doing too many shots too quickly, stuff like that, and they just pass out, but then they go into a coma and die. So... This is important to know because it doesn't matter who you are, um, this can happen. And it's also important to know for another reason, which is um, that on the detox side, uh, if you drink a lot often enough um, and you're going through that cycle over and over and over again, you're going to build a tolerance. And I'll show you that in a second. But when you come out, you can really be in danger um, when you're during the detox. Um, so, you know, again, if you only had a little bit to drink, maybe you just feel a little anxiety or um, a little fearful or something or a little uncomfortable and then you feel fine again. Um, but the more you drink, right, you have a hangover or you get shaky, um, you might get developed tremors, um, perception distortion, just like, you know, hallucinating, um, increased blood pressure, 
uh, body function stimulation, like that's just losing control of your bodily functions, going to the bathroom on yourself, throwing up on yourself, um, going to the bathroom in the bed uh, instead of the bathroom, things like that. Um, and then convulsions, seizures, coma, death, right? That's all from the detox of the substance rather than um, from the use. And, and alcohol is a very dangerous drug to detox from. And so we, uh, in treatment settings and in detoxes, will help people to withdraw from the drug um, alcohol by um, using some, something in the same class and titrating the person off. So lowering the amount uh, down over time so that you can extend that curve and flatten that curve out and um, extend it out over time. So whereas you would detox too quickly, um, spike up really high and could go into a seizure, coma, or death. Instead, we keep the person um, on a little bit of the drugs uh, in that same class and take them down slowly, 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 so that they detox slowly over time and don't, don't run the risk of dying. We used to do this in the olden days by giving people shots of alcohol or whiskey or whatever. Um, thank how we don't have to do that anymore. Stimulants essentially do the opposite of what um, depressants or sedative hypnotics do. Um, they will go up on a curve and then down on a curve. And so um, use, um, when using, you can die. Um, frequently, it's like the increased blood pressure, the um, stimulants will cause rapid uh, problems with the heart, co uh, cocaine psychosis, other things like that. And then, so you're poisoning your body, right? And then your heart can explode. Um, so with uh, this medical detoxification thing, um, I just want to kind of explain this a little bit more and what we see, um, two things that are important to understand, well, a few things, three things that are important to understand. One is understanding tolerance, two, the detox process, and then third is um, why um, it's important to get help or seek help if a relapse happens. So you know, in the beginning, a person might have a few drinks, um, uh, like we said, and then come out the other side and then back to the natural threshold on that orange line. Um, over time, what happens is there wasn't enough time to detox out the substance out of the body before the person starts to use again. And so um, we start to build a tolerance over time, right? And so now instead of starting out at the natural threshold, I'm starting out a little bit above the curve and I have like, a, I feel a little anxious and I have a drink and I feel a little bit better, a little, I feel, start to get a little bit more normal, maybe a little bit loose. And then I need a few more drinks to get drunk, right? Over time, that continues to be a curve that overlaps, right? I haven't detoxed out everything and I start drinking again. I have a hangover and I have a Bloody Mary. I feel better. I have two more and now I feel kind of normal. Okay, so I've had three drinks and I feel normal, right? Um, and in fact, I am acting normal, but then I need, you know, 10 more to get drunk. So now I'm having 13 drinks to get drunk instead of where maybe I only needed eight to 10 before, right? So that just keeps increasing and increasing and increasing and increasing where a person can increase to such a crazy amount of alcohol, right? And so like by the time I got sober, I was drinking massive amounts of hard liquor, um, which would not be uh, able to be normally had, right? I would normally cause someone to die, be far, far lower than where that um, coma, seizure, coma, death kind of place was when drinking. Um, we're surpassing that because Right? I am able to like have 10 drinks now to curb all of that detox. So I drink to treat the symptoms and then I drink 10 or 20 more in order to uh, feel drunk. So that's kind of what happens to people over time where they get really high BAC levels they, um, and they come into treatment and you can't just take them directly off of those substances. They have to have a longer period um, to come off of that substance. And so this is what we're kind of looking for with people when they come into a treatment or detox setting um, to making sure that they're safe and, um, and can recover. The other thing that you can imagine is, is that because this disease is prone to relapse, um, that, um, and if this is what was happening at the time that you went into treatment and you take some treatment and then you leave and then at some point are not doing enough treatment or for whatever reason the relapse happens, um, people will um, return to where they used to be pretty rapidly. Um, with alcohol, you know, the brain says, I need more, I need more, I need more, not just with alcohol, any substance, right? Um, and, but with alcohol, it takes time for the substance to get into your system, right? Um, with things like heroin, you can do it all in one shot. And so if the brain says, I need more of that, I need more of that, I need more of that, and you pick up where you left off, 
it's going to kill you, right? All at one time, you take it um, and, and you relapse and you die. Um, so sometimes the relapse at, at death, um, overdose death is, is pretty, I mean, it's accidental whenever it happens, I think, um, because people do too much of it without either without knowing what was in it or too much of it thinking like, I needed that, I need, I need more, I need more, I need more. Um, particularly people who have gone back to a natural threshold after a detox system, um, and now their brain is still saying, I need that much to survive. So all of that said, um, it kind of leads me to say, you know, if you're watching this and um, you are, you've been a family member and you've been playing a medical professional, I'm just here to tell you, you're not a medical professional for your loved ones and you need to get medical help for people um, it, when they are in a detox um, and have a substance use disorder. That's just how it is. Um, it's the only safe way to do it. Um, and you are not responsible for, for trying to do that for someone. So please get help. Um, and if someone has relapsed, please get help for them. Um, I think that's the, the best thing that I can say about, about that uh, component. And it also speaks to why it's so important to follow treatment recommendations um, so that you can stay in recovery. Um, so recovery, um, by definition, is a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life, and strive to reach their full potential. Um, it's a great definition, I think. It comes from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, um, our federal government's um, associate or organization for um, uh, mental health and substance abuse. And um, I think it's a really good definition, and it's also one that I think everybody could use. Anybody who's been touched by substance use disorder, so loved ones, family members, we all deserve to have a recovery from this, and um, we all deserve to have a health, uh, healthy, uh, self-directed life, living our fullest potential. SAMHSA describes four components of recovery, health, home, purpose, and community, um, and we uh, work with folks in order to identify how to become healthy, how to live healthy, how to get a um, stabilized home um, that is safe for their recovery, um, how to find purpose, uh, and how to develop a community. These areas are critical to a person's success in recovery and to keeping the substance use disorder at bay. Um, the, the thing that I want folks to take away from today, you know, other than, of course, that we, we call this a disease for a reason, is that um, it's critical for people to follow the recommendations of professionals, you know, um, it, for a long time, people try to treat themselves, you know, or they try to have family um, help with treating them. And I, I would just say that there's a lot of people in, in our world that can help with treating you and your disease and helping you in recovery. Um, do what's suggested, follow your continuing care plan, um, follow what's recommended from the people that know how to do this. Um, it is the way. Um, to find success in recovery um, and to keep the disease in remission. And it does work. Uh, we are living proof of that. So um, if you have questions, please contact me. Um, I, my email address is here, jswan at addictionrecoveryconsulting.org. You can call me. That's my cell phone. It's confidential, 720-412-1300. And you can also contact Farley. Um, their information is on the website. Um, and I hope that I get to meet you one day and that you are living well and staying healthy. Thanks.